Don here in Florida, and welcome back to another episode of Mr. Obsessive. <laughs> yeah, I'm still obsessing over that stupid bandsaw, the Frankensaw. Uh, you know, Mr. Pete, a while back, said, you know, the problem with these Delta 14 inch bandsaws is they just don't have enough mass. Uh, that's the unfortunate problem with them. The good thing about them, though, is they are compact enough that as you can see, you can set them up in your garage and use them all day long, as long as they're working properly. My obsession comes to making it work better than properly. And you, if you've been following along, you've probably seen a few of the modifications that I've done. And today, my obsession is to take even more of the vibration out of the uh, Delta bandsaw. And the reason being is, one of the factors that comes up when you're cutting metal with a Delta bandsaw, particularly the converted versions from wood to metal, is that the amount of vibration you have can instill harmonic into the piece you're working on, which can in fact cause uh, chatter or poor cutting. Uh, if you have a very smooth work table and you have a very smooth movement of the saw through the work, then it will tend to cut a lot easier. Uh, with less chatter, less issues. Anybody that's worked on a larger bandsaw, like a, a Dual or a, even a Powermatic for that matter, where you're talking a saw that weighs a thousand pounds or more, you don't run into the problems that you run into with these lighter saws. So, yes, I'm putting some mass into the saws, but let's also use our heads a little bit here. Do we actually need to have just mass? To qualify what I'm talking about in this video, though, I have to be able to measure the movement or the vibration within the work. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, if I take out my handy dandy whiteboard here and I draw a line right here and put a zero at the end, we'll call that zero movement or dead or static. There's nothing going on here when the saw's not running. But as soon as you turn the saw on, you're gonna have a vibration that can actually be measured like this. And what we do normal is we put a piezo electric sensor onto the piece that we're working with, say a, a, a table in this case, or a bearing or whatnot. And that piezo sensor through an oscilloscope, we'd be able to, to format this and we'd be able to see what's going on and if this looks like calculus to you it, it is uh, and we're going to break this off into one second intervals every rise we see here like this we call this amplitude and when we work with uh oscilloscopes we're usually looking at at velocity and acceleration but for to simplify this because we all know calculus We'll talk about amplitude and frequency, how often these occur from here to here to here to here, okay? So if this is a one second interval here, this would be in hertz, okay? We measure hertz in one second intervals. This would be one, two, three, four, five, six hertz for this one section that we're looking at here. Now, that is very, very hard to see or feel. I mean, you can feel it. You can feel it vibrating under your hand. But we need to be able to measure this. If we're going to make a change, and the change I primarily want to make is in this right here, amplitude. If we can chop the amplitude like this, it's going to be a, a lot softer feeling. We're not going to have that movement or that motion that can throw your work around on the table. So. I'm thinking, how can we measure this? Okay, well, to do this in the shop, why can't we do it with a dial indicator? Why not? I mean, a dial indicator moves up and down, right? Here, 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 up and down like this. And however many times it moves up and down within a second will allow us to view amplitude and frequency. The problem is, is most of the frequencies that we're dealing with that we can feel or that we notice or that are causing problems in our work are going to be anywhere in the say the 20 to 100 hertz or meaning it's going to be affecting 20 to 100 times per second our work 
So how do we get our dial indicator to measure this? Well, let's do it with the thing that you're viewing this with right now. Let's do it with the camera. Let's, sit, let's take our camera, set it in slow motion, which means we get more frames per second to actually see what's going on here. We'll take it in on the computer, we'll slow it down, and we'll, we'll count how high our amplitude is, if the dial indicator is capable of keeping up, and how often that amplitude occurs. So we're gonna look at amplitude and frequency. And these are gonna be the two things we use to measure and determine if we're on the right track to calming the movement or the vibration in our work table, okay? So let's try it. Okay, so what I've done here is I brought my grinder over here because we need something solid that's not actually touching this because if we have this dial indicator on here, we're just measuring the vibration between different components. Say like when I did the arm here, I had the dial indicator on the table and we were measuring the movement of the arm, the swing this way, but we were also pick, picking up the vibration. So trying to actually measure how much this table's moving up and down <clears throat> means that we're gonna have to have the dial indicator base sit away from the table, okay? With the dial indicator floating over the table and I've slightly preloaded it here and I want it close to the blade because this is where most of the action is, right here. Where that blade's going through the work, we, we want to reduce that vibration. We want to know what it is right there close coming into the blade. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the saw on and I've set the camera to slow motion and we're going to run this and see how much vibration we have in that table. Okay, so I, I ran it for a little over a minute and a half. So this is our baseline. This is, this is what we know more or less we can expect from a box stock uh, Delta multi-speed bandsaw, meaning this is a metal and wood cutting bandsaw. Let's go over and see what the Franken saw is at right now. Okay, so we're over here on Franken saw now. And this saw, of course, has already been modified. I'm expecting less vibration out of it now. All things being equal, we're gonna set the motor hertz to 60 hertz, okay? Because we know we have a 60 hertz motor on the other saw. And let's fire it up and see what this looks like. Of course, the belt pulleys are also in the same position. So. All right, right, right off the bat, we can see there's a whole lot less movement here. Okay. The other one looked like it was kicking about a good five thousandths up and down. This one looks like it's hitting about a thousandths, maybe a little more. So this is probably so good I should put a best test on it. As a matter of fact, I think I will just for sheets and giggles, people. Hang on. Okay, here we are with the best test. Looks like it's hitting about a thousandths. We'll run it for a minute. Okay, let's see what happens if we change frequency here. It gets a little erratic as it's slowing down. Well, look at that. Just by changing the motor's frequency and the speed of the saw, you can change the amplitude somewhat, definitely the frequency. This is what allows us to improve a saw's cut. If it's not cutting well at one speed or frequency, we can change it. And we can actually see one spot right there where it practically is not moving. And that's a little over 60 hertz right there. That's good to know. Right there. 62 hertz. Okay. Okay, so here we are back inside. Uh, this is the footage we just did. And what I did was I, I took the videos that I made of the gauges and I, I had the camera in slow motion so that I have, would have enough uh, frames to do this in. And what I can do now is I've loaded them up on here and slowed them down and I can stretch this out 
here on the screen. Okay, and I can gap these in one second intervals. So from here to here is one second, for example. Now, with each one of these seconds, I can run it and I can count quickly uh, how many movements we have on the dial here. And that's kind of hard when you do it that way. So another way to do it would be to set your cursor, or find your one second mark and slowly drag your cursor across and watch it bounce. Okay. Now the needle isn't quite keeping up with the frequency. I can see how much it's rising and falling here. And in this case, as we go through it, we're getting a, a distance of about five thousandths here on this one here. This is the first one we did. And so that's an amplitude of five thousandths. Right there, she's bouncing back and forth. We have 10,000 intervals here, so it's hitting about five thousandths. So, what I can do, because it's impossible to watch it, I can't slow it down enough, I can slowly drag and count the movements on the dial here. Okay, but another thing I can do is I can simply come down here and the camera also catches the sound. Each one of these jumps in sound is an interval. So one, two, three, four, five, six, go on like that. And what I'm catching on this first one, this is the the uh, original type bandsaw that it's not modified. This is giving us an amplitude of five thousandths with a frequency of, um, it's looking like about 33 hertz. I'm counting 33 to 44. On some of these, it's changing up a little bit. Um, maybe the speed of the saw, maybe the motor, uh, you know, maybe it's just the gears in there. Uh, we're going anywhere from 28 to some of these are 34. But uh, it averages out on each one. I've, I've done these a number of them by seconds and it's averaging out about 33 to 34. So this is the base model machine. This is the base number that I wanted to get. When we move over to the other machine here, let's move up the row here, here and close this down here. I've only, believe it or not, I've only got like three minutes on here, four minutes. Um, here we go on the other machine. Okay, and it's gonna zoom in in a second here. And when it zooms in, it slows down. Boom, here we go. And if you watch it right here, you can see it's moving about one thousandths. And I didn't think this gauge was catching it very accurately. And so I moved up, I put the best test on there. And the best test is in fact, moving about one thousandths. So apparently that other gauge was fine. Um, it was capturing it. So when I get onto the best test here, again, I can stretch this out into one second intervals and I can pick a second here. And in one second, again, I can count. And on this machine, whether I'm using the other gauge, the other dial, or the best test, I'm averaging out between about 16 to 17 hertz. And this has a travel of, of course, uh, one thousandths, so of amplitude. So in this case, I've been able to determine both my frequency and amplitude um, visually here. I can do it on the sound waves here. I can count here by slowly dragging. So I think we're, this is probably not the most accurate way to do it, but what it does is it gives us a baseline for where we're going. Um, now that I know what my approximate amplitude is, one thousandths in my frequency, uh, now I can shoot to lower, um, preferably the amplitude. I wanna lower the amplitude as much as I can. The frequency really is coming out from um, what we're finding down below, the, the gears meshing in there and possibly the motor. Um, I, I'd be more apt to, to say the gears in this case because the motor I know runs at 60 Hertz and uh, it's so far down in the bowels and separated by a belt and whatnot that I, I really don't think I'm picking it up. So 
Um, I, I think this is mainly gears. Uh, same thing back here. It, it's more pronounced back on the original saw. When we go back to the original saw, it's, see that I'm only got a little over three minutes of footage. Um, when I go back over onto the original saw here, it's much, much more pronounced. And that's because there's a great big bull gear inside of there. Um, on my modified version, I took that giant bull gear out and, and changed it over. I changed it over for a built pulley system on that secondary side. The primary is still driven by a gear, but in this one, you still got that bull gear in there. And I think this is where a lot of it's coming from. Another thing I've, I've factored in is this saw has two belts running at different speeds and they're different lengths. And when I remove one belt or the other, it really tames this down. I, I'm, I've got an amplitude when I remove one of those belts, almost half of what this is. If we're getting five thousandths jump here, it might be two and a half when you remove one of the belts. So a lot of, a lot of slap of the belts, it creates a lot of this vibration, believe it or not. All right, so there we go. So what's Don's method of reducing the vibration in this table? Well, we're gonna do it two ways. We're gonna flip it over, and we're gonna use a combination of Mr. Pete's mass and Don's intellect. And I just so happen to have a bunch of cast iron bars cut out here. I'm not a railroad guy, but I found this out by the railroad, and it's heavy. So we're going to use this as the mass underneath the table. So let's do that. Ugh. That we can use to weight this. But we're not just going to weight it. Let me show you something. If you've ever fooled around with engines before, you know at the end of a crankshaft, there's what we call a harmonic balancer. The harmonic balancer is basically a heavy weight on the outside of a hub. Between that weight and that hub is a viscous core, and that viscous core allows that weight to slightly move back and forth. And the idea here is every time there's a power pulse in the crankshaft, okay, the crankshaft moves ahead of the weight because the viscous material can't keep up with the pulse, and then the harmonic balancer catches up. So basically, what that balancer is doing, what that weight is doing, is it's counteracting or catching the vibration in that crankshaft. And, and if you think of calculus, for example, this is how they do it with like the uh, audio phones. They, they use a counteracting signal. Um, and the easiest way to think about that is if you've ever taken a rope and, and tied it onto a ladder and then whipped it like this, you can see it makes that, that curve just like I showed if you were to start whipping that, okay, let's say that that uh, that rope is moving across like this, and then you whip it again, well that rope gets to the end, it hits that ladder, now it wants to come back. If you're hitting that rope again, while it's coming back, the rope goes dead in the middle. I don't know if you've ever done that when you were a kid. That's basically what we're doing here. We're gonna take a viscous material, and in this case, we're gonna use the uh, Flex Glue White and we're gonna glue these weights into place. The idea here is these weights have just enough room to move inside of, the, of each position that they're gonna be placed. And this will allow the weight, when there's a vibration occurring, to move slightly to counteract whatever movement's going on on the table. So hopefully they cancel out. Now I could totally screw this up. This may not work, but I'm assuming, or I'm thinking just through general logic that it should probably work. Side, notice all these surfaces I've cleaned and painted up nicely. I wanna make sure that adhesive sticks, that's why I, I did that. These parts are actually really heavy, these cast iron blocks. So we'll see how that works. Of course, the, uh, the other advantage to doing it this way is I don't have to worry about uh, welding all this into place or tack welding it anyway, which can create heat in the surface and possibly warp it. It is a nice flat surface, so 
I don't want to do that. Okay, so we're all glued in. The rubber stuff, it, it does feel rubbery, but I was hoping it would be a little bit softer than that. We're going to go ahead and, and set it up on there and uh, see what happens. So give me a minute to set it up on the uh, saw. And here we are on the best test. And as you can see, it's not even bouncing around like it was before. It, it's just really reading it fairly true now. So I really, really like the way it simmered down. And we're at the 60 hertz that we were at before where it was a little rougher. <clears throat> okay, so here we go again. I'm looking at the best test. I've slowed it down on the video here. And when I run it, watch this. This is in slow motion. It, it's running at less than one ten thousandths of an inch of movement. So it, it has really just massively dropped. And this doesn't surprise me. Um, because of the amount of weight that I put in it. That table now is really heavy. I probably quadrupled the weight of that thing with those cast iron inserts. And I do think that the, the rubber compound that I used to insert those is absorbing some of that weight. So it is doing exactly what I wanted it to do. Uh, so when you're looking at it here, let's back it up, move it back into this range here. This is at full speed. You can see a lot of bounce here, okay? Because we're picking up the actual frequency and it is showing it move. But when you go into slow motion and you start measuring that frequency across the seconds here, the frequency is less than one hertz. So I don't know exactly, but it's less than one hertz versus, I forgot what it was when we started. I think it was uh, 16 or 17 hertz when we started. Or obviously that, that rubberized stuff in there has to be doing exactly what I said. It's causing a, a, a counter movement here. And the interesting thing is I used different size weights because of the different size of the squares. So they were, they were weighted different. So you have these weights all moving at different frequencies. So I think they're self-canceling to a good extent. But the amplitude is what I'm really, really happy with because that amplitude is what you feel moving up and down like this. So I'll see if I can compile a video showing the difference between the stock bandsaw versus the modified bandsaw versus this one with the table. So that's about it. I think we've done it. So I guess that's going to just about cover it with this project on the Franken saw. Obviously, I have more things going on with this saw. It's a ongoing project. Every thing I seem to do to this saw just seems to make it cut and work that much better. So I'm really happy with the way things are going. Uh, for, for any of you doubting Thomases that don't believe that uh, using a, a good dial indicator um, can help you uh, tone down or improve how your bandsaw works as far as measuring frequency, uh, giving you a baseline and then something to shoot for or something to drop to. Um, stick around for just a minute at the end of this video and uh, we're gonna throw a little sideball at you. So that's about it from Florida. As always from Florida, Don out. Okay, because we didn't have a point of reference to check the other machine, we're gonna do it on this one. So let's take a look. Okay, we're maxing out about five, six. My other test was five, eight. Six one. Okay, so. and this will be an amplitude test. So let's see what this is coming out at. Okay, so point three two four. So we've got an amplitude of uh, average point three oh five millimeter. So that'll be the amplitude, the rise and fall of the table. And it's, it's staying really constant. Max, 0.2, minimum, 0.2, average, 0.2. So, of course, to convert that to frequency, we'd have to square it. This would be our amplitude. And that's in two, two, 
and that's in two places. So here we're looking at uh, max 0 0.029, minimum 0 0.002. So, and that's in millimeters, of course. So we'll convert that to SAE here in a minute. 